I'm James Williams, and I'm going to be talking about um, the attention economy and some uh, moral and political uh, questions that I've been researching over the last several years. Uh, but before I get into questions of technology, I wanted to start with uh, back in ancient Greece, where uh, there was a philosopher named Diogenes of Sinope. Uh, now, most philosophers don't live in giant ceramic barrels, uh, but Diogenes did. He had taken a vow of poverty, and he was kind of considered what we would call today a troll. He would show up to Socrates' lectures and eat loudly to interrupt it. He would deface currency. Uh, he was seen as just rude, impulsive, outrageous. Uh, but he was admired by Alexander the Great, who was arguably the most powerful person in the world at the time. Uh, and there's a great story where Alexander one day approaches Diogenes in his barrel in the marketplace and fawningly approaches him, flanked by his retinue of servants and, and, and guards. And he says, Diogenes, I respect you and admire you so much. Tell me what you would have. Uh, I will grant any wish that you have. Uh, just name it, and you'll have it. And Diogenes was standing in, uh, lying in the, uh, the, uh, in the sun at the time, and he looked at Alexander, and he, he said, stand out of my light. And I, I love this story for a lot of reasons. Um, but one is that I think it gives us a good uh, way of thinking about our response to uh, those, those forces that have come into our life uh, in the digital age and offer to give us all sorts of needs, uh, to, 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 to fill all sorts of needs and wishes. In a lot of ways, they have done so really well. But I think that you know, there's a light that they have been standing in that we haven't really um, seen or talked about as clearly as we ought to. Uh, it's, in a, it's a light that I think, if it's obscured for too long and to such a degree that you know, the other benefits technology gives us, which you know, are, are immense, uh, will do us um, not very much good. And the light that I mean is the light of our attention. Um, I worked at Google for several years, and I had an epiphany one day that um, there was more technology around me, more information, more data around me than ever, but it was harder than ever to do the stuff that I wanted to do in my own life. And this seemed to me to be exactly wrong, exactly contrary to the purpose of technology. And I think that something very deep and, and maybe irreversible is happening to human attention in the digital age. Um, and I could think it could be the defining moral and political challenge of our time. So what I want to do here is, again, give a very broad view of why I think this is the case and hint at some ideas of what we might be able to start to do about it. So the general narrative of kind of the information age is that you know, more information is better, more data is better. Um, most of human history has been lived in an environment of information scarcity. Uh, and the role of technology, information technology, was to break down that barrier between us and information. Um, but as Herbert Simon pointed out in the 1970s, when information becomes abundant, uh, a kind of figure ground reversal takes place that makes attention the scarce resource. And you know, this reversal has happened now at the scale of the entire world as information technologies have enveloped you know, human life. Um, and the ubiquitousness of, of technology, being able to get any piece of information, contact anybody in the world with this device in your pocket, um, you know, it, it's really made our attention more scarce than at any time in history, um, and as a result, uh, the object of competition more so than any time in history. Um, there are several trends that have been converging over the last several decades um, to produce this, uh, this environment in which we now live, where most of our technologies are designed to compete for and to grab and to redirect our attention. Um, one is kind of the, uh, the general increase in our knowledge of psychology and the various ways in which we think uh, unconsciously, uh, heuristically, automatically, and the psychological vulnerabilities that can be exploited by design, whether that's uh, design of a shopping mall where you, know, you put the escalators opposite each other where you have to walk all the way around to get to the next one so you see more items, you're more likely to buy it. So all sorts of nudges, all sorts of design uh, tricks that can be used to, to exploit these, the, these kind of cognitive vulnerabilities. Another trend that this has come in conversation with is this enormous infrastructure of measurement, uh, optimization, message delivery, experimentation uh, that now the, the internet has essentially enabled. Um, there's really nothing like it on a historical scale in terms of 
the, the ability to um, quickly understand how to persuade people and then to, to try different approaches and then to persuade people better. Um, and this is, you know, at any given time, the products you're using day to day on your phone, on your laptop, there, there are probably hundreds of experiments running uh, that are just trying to improve better, more and more the, the degree to which they can persuade you. Uh, and so I think that it's not hyperbole to say that, that the internet as we've inherited it is probably the largest uh, and most advanced um, method or system of human uh, attitudinal uh, and behavioral manipulation in human history. And I think t on top of this, it's, it's, it's incredibly centralized. So a few people in a few rooms in one state, in one country, uh, have the ability to shape what you know, over two billion people will think today and, and how they will behave today, how they will live. And to me, this is an, an enormous political question that um, is just, uh, it's not being talked about at the level it should. You know, Alexander the Great could have only imagined uh, this sort of power. Uh, and so I think what, what's happened is, is I think, you know, we've, we've started with this notion of technology as a tool and it's very rapidly become our environment, our whole informational environment. And, you know, as McLuhan said, you know, we create our tools and then our tools create us. And so I think what happens is that when we, uh, when we, this entire environment becomes uh, uh, persuasive, we get this, uh, just this constant barrage of persuasive attempts uh, coming at us. And so the word term attention economy is basically used to talk about this, this total environment of, uh, of requests for our attention, pings on our attention, uh, and now with smartphones, they're uh, more ubiquitous than ever uh, and, and more powerful than ever. Um, and the entire purpose of it is to grab our attention and move it toward one goal or another. And most of the time, the goals that it's trying to move us toward um, are not the goals that we have for ourselves. So if you think about the goals that you have, so your goals for attending this talk, uh, for attending the Festival of Ideas for uh, you know, this week, this year, and even longer, uh, they're probably things like, you know, I want to spend more time with my family, or I want to learn how to play the piano, or uh, I want to take that trip I've been thinking about and putting off for too long. Uh, you know, these are the real human goals. These are the, this is the stuff that when we're on our deathbeds, we will regret not having done. Uh, but if you look at our technologies, you know, they say they're, they're there to help us improve these things in our lives. But if you look at what's actually on the dashboards, what are actually the metrics that they're optimizing for, it tends not to be that stuff. It tends to be things like, uh, the amount of time we spend with them on the site. <coughs> so how long are we spending with them? Uh, how engaged are we with it? Uh, how many times are we clicking, tapping, scrolling? Uh, you know, how much of our attention, how many, uh, or uh, it, how many eyeballs are they able to get? Um, you know, I don't know anybody who has these goals for themselves. Like nobody I know wakes up in the morning and says, I want to see how much time I can possibly spend on Facebook today. Like, does anybody here have that goal? <laughs> I've never met any one person. I'd love to meet that person because I just love to understand their mind. Um, but I think that this is, to me, this is like a way bigger problem than we typically uh, think about. Because, you know, if the purpose of technology is to help make our lives go better than they otherwise would, to help us do those things that we want to do, um, there, this, I think, represents an enormous kind of divergence between the human goals and the technology's goals. And again, at this global scale of, of enormous persuasive power. And so I think that the inconvenient truth of the attention economy is that, you know, even though we trust it to shape our lives every day, um, it's fundamentally not on our side. <laughs> um, you know, I trust my phone. I trust, you know, my, uh, my digital information systems to be kind of like a GPS for my life. And, but we would never put up with a GPS that took you to the destination on the other side of town from where you wanted to go or to a different city. So if we wouldn't put up with that from a technology that, that guides us through physical space, why would we put up with it with one that guides us through uh, informational space? And every once in a while, uh, a little light gets through uh, and, and people in the industry kind of speak very bluntly about um, the, this, the, way, the fact that this is the case. So the CEO of Netflix a little while back said, um, and Netflix, in addition to Snapchat and YouTube, one of their competitors is sleep. So, <laughs> A little bit of misalignment with human well-being there, but um, so I think the reality that, that we face now is, um, you know, there's been a, these kind of writers at the periphery of society of the last century or so, warning about the 
the threats to freedom that come not from coercion, from the use of force, from the boot stamping on the human face forever, but from persuasion, from seduction, from distraction. And um, I think one of those uh, who made these points well was Aldous Huxley, who in Brave New World Revisited said that the defenders of freedom in his time had failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. And you know, what I've realized is, is that we've made this exact same mistake in the era of digital technologies. Um, you know, for all the things that they do very well for us, um, they've uh, you know, exponentially increased the, the number of distractions in our life. And so I think it's important to then ask the question, how do we start to take into account our infinite appetite for distractions? How can we you know, bring technology back on our side, you know, fix the GPS's logic, so to speak? Um, and I think it would, have, it would mean starting to assert and defend uh, a, a, f a freedom of attention of a sort. Um, and you know, I think this is a, a, a type of freedom that, that historically has been important, but there hasn't been a whole lot in our world that could seriously threaten it. You, know, you could always walk away from the TV. You could sort of you know, leave the, that partic particular context in which you were, uh, your, you know, your attention was being under siege. Uh, but now it's, it's everywhere all the time. You know? uh, and that being said, though, I think we can find some good, uh, some good thinking on, on these issues from the great thinkers on the topic of liberty. So, uh, in Mill and On Liberty uh, wrote that the appropriate region of human liberty uh, comprises first the inward domain of consciousness, liberty of thought and feeling, absolute freedom of opinion and sentiment on all subjects, practical or speculative. This principle requires liberty of tastes and pursuits, framing the, the plan of our life to suit our own character. And so I think that, you know, this is, uh, what he's saying I think is the, the first freedom is the freedom of mind. And, and you know, it, 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 crucially he adds that the freedom of expression, of speech, which we rightly uh, hold up and, uh, and, and, and optimize for, uh, it rests on the, the, the availability of a freedom of religion, or, sorry, freedom of attention. So uh, freedom of mind is, is prerequisite to the freedom of speech, to freedom of expression. It gives it its value. And so I think, you know, we've done pretty well at giving attention to the, those freedoms of expression and speech, but I think now the challenge is to start giving attention to the freedom of attention, so to speak. And so I think what Mill gets at here, what we can take from this is, is that part of what this means is, is thinking more broadly about what we mean by attention. So uh, when we normally use the term attention, we think about uh, kind of the type of attention we're giving each other right now. Uh, you know, kind of the, the way, like the immediate management of our perception within the task domain. Um, it's what cognitive scientists uh, often call the spotlight of attention. And so, you know, when technology undermines the spotlight of attention, often kind of the paradigmatic example is interruptions or notifications. So let's say I'm trying to read a book uh, on a, a lazy Sunday afternoon and my phone goes and then I see, oh, the President of the United States has tweeted his latest <laughs> uh, daily outrage. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, we, you know, I'm sure we can all you know, feel, feel this. And, it's, and, it's, uh, and people say, well, you know, people, this is a great way for for politicians, politicians to connect with people or whatever. Um, and you know, I think one, one way of, of, of looking at this is that, you know, going back to the kind of the system one, system two kind of thinking where we have our kind of automatic selves, impulsive selves, and then our more kind of intentional, kind of reflective, rational selves. So this is actually taken from a website that, uh, that Google puts together uh, for advertisers, telling them how to advertise better, uh, how to get their message out, to get more clicks, impressions, et cetera. So this, it says, um, smartphones allow us to act on any impulse at any time. It's like, okay. Uh, and then it's, we take immediate action whenever we want to learn, find, do, or buy something. Okay, but you know, we also take immediate action based on impulses when it's not the stuff we want to do, right? That's why we, there are things we do that we regret. Uh, and, and so, you know, um, like losing sleep watching Netflix, this, this kind of thing. So, um, so but I think what, what is represented here is this kind of dual view of users that the tech industry takes, right? So um, there's an appeal to impulsive behavior when it is exploitable, and then there's an appeal to re the rational, reflective uh, part of users when uh, they're defending against that, right? So like, like, you know, making you read 10 pages of terms and conditions or expecting people to do that, this kind of thing. So, but I think what happens then is though, over time, obviously, interruptions, notifications, these little annoyances that we typically have thought of as distractions, they, they, they add up, they, they, they're not one-off phenomenon. They, they, they create an entire environment of this type of distraction. 
and you know, like this is the kind of the nature of our mental world now, right? And I'm sure you, you guys can all kind of relate with this. And it, it seems like it's getting really weird, to be honest. <laughs> um, and and so I think what happens is that when you know, it, it's not just about doing what we want to do. That the, that's that's not just what's being undermined by the attention economy and these persuasive this kind of in system of industrialized persuasion. Uh, it's uh, also about you know being who we want to be. Uh, so our longer term goals, our higher level goals, uh, it, it, it gets in the way of that. So uh, for instance, we could, uh, one place we see this, uh, there are a lot of different examples of this, but one place we see it is in infinite feeds on, uh, on say social media sites or other, other platforms, um, which you know, by randomizing the reward that they give you, uh, it, it has the character of a slot machine. It's the same psychological dynamic that's at play in the addictive compulsive nature of slot machines. So when we pu are pulling down to refresh, we're literally playing an informational slot machine. Uh, and you know, it's an, I think it's an, a good question. If we regulate the gambling industry you know, in a certain way, the, the psychological dynamics are exactly the same. With uh, information technologies, why do, we not, uh, why do we not kind of give it more attention there? Um, and so then all of, you know, this becomes our entire kind of environment, right? So it, it, like as McLuhan said, the, all these media are art forms that have the power of imposing their own assumptions. It's not that we're somehow just using them, like they become our, our world, right? We shape our tools, our tools also shape us. Uh, they become the real world, they shape what remains of the old world at will. Uh, and so when we kind of internalize the dynamics of, of our media, uh, it, uh, that in the, you know, the attention economy optimizes for these lower level engagement metrics, clicks, impressions, views. Um, I think it results in a kind of pettiness or short termism, uh, kind of prioritizing lower level goals as opposed to these higher level goals that we have. And so uh, we see this in the way that fame uh, in, you know, in, in culture, but especially there's been some interesting research in children's television shows. This is now the, the value that is treated as most worth pursuing as opposed to say like 10, 15 years ago, it was you know, pro-social community types of values. Um, and, it's, and similarly, I think you know, there's a kind of pettiness and we see this I think uh, all, the, all over the place in our personal lives, in, our, in the political world for sure. And I think it's, it's, it's um, another one of these you know, cracks where kind of the bluntness of the, of, of, of the system gets through is when Les Moonves, the CBS chairman and CEO said last February that Donald Trump's candidacy may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. So we, it, it, it fragments uh, you know, the, the body politic into these kind of uh, sub-interests that, uh, that take their own interest as the highest good. So, so that's the, kind of expanding the notion of attention beyond just kind of doing what we want to do and getting at questions of identity, of habits, of values, being who we want to be. But I think there's one more level we could talk about, which is uh, wanting what we want to want. And so we see this, I think, uh, just one example is in kind of the prevalence of outrage uh, and the way in which the dynamics of the attention economy uh, optimize for and, 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 and uh, accentuate outrage. And outrage is really important. Uh, it, you know, in small tribal groups, uh, it was really useful. Um, but you know, at a global scale, it, it kind of reverses into a kind of uh, you know, witch hunting kind of uh, you know, not burning people at the stake, but trying to destroy them reputationally. Uh, and, and, you know, I think we see this, um, you know, one example is the Seats of the Lion uh, incident, which some of you may remember, where a dentist from Minnesota killed a lion in Zimbabwe, and it was really bad and he shouldn't have done it, but he didn't deserve, you know, the kind of, uh, the public shaming, the, the just the outrage fests that, that we get. And, and, it's, and it, we do this because, you know, it's, it gives us a sense of moral clarity, social solidarity, uh, it's a way for us to signal that we're trustworthy to others when we express our outrage. Um, and it seems like we have one of these like outrage cascades every week now. So this week it's Harvey Weinstein or, or you know, whatever. And it's not to say that, the, that uh, the, the concerns that motivate them are invalid. It's to say that the, the ways in which the conversations play out, the ways in which uh, the, the dynamics of the attention economy uh, uh, kind of channel the conversation is not conducive to um, the kind of society, the kind of values, the kind of politics that we really uh, want uh, ultimately to have. So in this deepening of attention as a concept, so we have doing what we want to do, being who we want to be, and then wanting what we want to want. And so this is uh, importantly the way that Harry Frankfurt, the philosopher at Princeton, thinks about the, the, the structure of the human will. And it, it, 
at the end of the day, I think that's what's at stake here. It, it's the kind of the coherence uh, of the human will. I, I think sometimes I think of the attention economy as being like just a constant uh, distributed denial of service attack on the human will. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it, 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 the dynamics are essentially are, are similar. So another way of, I guess, framing this in maybe a bit more jargony way is that, you know, we think about, you know, distraction as not just being functional distraction, which is, you know, how we've always thought of it, the kind of the annoyance that we momentarily get pulled away by and then come back to, but existential distraction as being about, you know, being able to not, not being able to connect with the values that you want, the identity that you want to have, um, you know, doing things that you ultimately regret later. And then I think on, on an even deeper level, epistemic distraction, which then is about the erosion of our underlying capabilities, like reason, willpower, uh, reflection, uh, deliberation, et cetera. And so this has been a useful heuristic for me to kind of think through some of these different effects. Um, and I know we're uh, uh, running a little bit short on time, so I'll go through the last of this part of this quickly. But basically, I, I think this attention economy, this system of industrialized persuasion we've inherited is intolerable. And um, I think, you know, as Aristotle said in politics, it's disgraceful to be unable to use our good things. Uh, and our technologies are good things. Like, there's so much good that they do. Uh, and and I, I don't think that this should be about pro versus anti-technology. I, I think we just need to reject those kind of dualities outright. Um, so I think, you know, that means we can't kind of just be the Luddites and go, you know, live off, uh, you know, in, in farms for the rest of our lives. Um, I mean, if you want to, that's cool, but uh, uh, I don't think it's a sustainable solution uh, in, in the face of, of these technological challenges. And, you know, another common uh, thing that, that's given in response to some of these kind of objections is, well, it's just up to people to work harder, right? Uh, you know, people can choose to not use technology. They can choose to do something else. Like we have, you know, I think this. I think you know maybe in the past, uh, in previous forms of media, th there there might have been some argument here. But I think this is essentially akin to saying, you know, thousands of the world's smartest PhD scientists, statisticians, designers, engineers are going to work every day to try to undermine your willpower. And so what you need to do is just have more willpower. Like that's. I just don't think it really. It really is a. a, a, a a reasonable solution, and uh, because at the end of the day, you know, as Erastus Wyman, who was head of the Canadian Telegraph, said in 1899, there is no competition against instantaneousness, uh, and I think that's that's the nature of this, uh, the problem we're up against here. It's just uh, the, the, the 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 constant pressure of instantaneousness. So, but I think in response to this, neither can we blame designers, uh, and I. I I have many friends in industry and I've talked to many people in industry and you know, nobody becomes a designer because they want to make people's lives worse. People go into design because they want to make people's lives better. They just get trapped in systems uh, that are not aligned with people's goals and, and interests. And so, um, so I don't think we can make this about blaming individual designers. I think this is a, a systemic problem. It's a question of uh, oops, sorry, what uh, Luciano Floridi, uh, uh, my supervisor at Oxford, calls infra ethics. Uh, there we go. So the ethics of the infrastructure, the environment in which people are making design decisions, business decisions. Uh, and I'll skip through that this in the interest of time. So I guess uh, I'll uh, end here because I think we're fairly, uh, do we, how much time do I have? Or, to the point? Two minutes, all right. Uh, so I think there are the, the question of then what do we do about, about all this? You know? um, so I think that there are important uh, interventions that are needed. Uh, at all levels of society. So um, from the metrics we use to, uh, to, uh, to identify success, right? Up-leveling those from things like clicks or views to things that are getting, get closer towards some idea of the real benefit that we provide to users. Um, and so there's a, a project that I'm involved with called Time Well Spent, and it's this idea of if now technology is trying to maximize our time spent, if we could move that to time well spent, then it would be a step toward putting them on our side. So there are things uh, in design patterns and processes, um, uh, the goals and incentives of design, uh, business models I think are a really crucial thing here, uh, you know, even the legal structure of corporations. Um, and I have some things in here about language and concepts, but I think uh, in the interest of time, so basically I think, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll skip through this uh, so we can get to Q&A. So, Basically, advertising is, uh, we don't have a good uh, common definition of advertising. We need to like, fundamentally reevaluate it. Um, so Thomas Paine in Common Sense said that a long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it 
superficial appearance of being right, and I think that's kind of the, the place we're at when it comes to the attention economy. Um, so basically, I think in our personal political uh, lives, um, we need to rethink the place of technology design with respect to politics. And I, in my view, tech, that means that we need to think of, of technology design as, as, in a sense, the ground of, of first political struggle. I think what has essentially happened is technologies have kind of done this in run around all these other societal systems, these systems that kind of design our lives towards certain values, towards certain goals. Um, and we're kind of in a position with these new systems that are operating directly on our attention. Uh, we're in a position that I think is akin to kind of like feudalism, uh, it, you know, it, where um, we, we, there's a certain sort of power we need to, uh, to assert, uh, at a certain sort of accountability we need to demand. Um, and you know, whether that's by incremental guidance and change or resistance and, and bigger sorts of change, uh, I think it needs to happen. I think it will take some time. Uh, obviously, this is a big problem, but I think, you know, in order to kind of do anything that matters in our own lives or collectively, we have to be able to give attention to what matters. And I think, at the end of the day, that's the question here: is if, if our digital technologies are are the, are what are primarily shaping the way we give attention to various things, how can we help them uh, uh, help us give attention to what matters? Um, so, you know, in the meantime, I think we should continue to support uh, and affirm the people who create these technologies, not demonize them, not blame them, but at the same time demand, um, as Diogenes did to Alexander the Great, uh, that they stand out of our light, uh, to me seems a pretty urgent priority. So uh, thank you all very much for your attention and thanks for coming. <laughs>